Hi everyone, it's Nathan Fan, the Magic Asian Man here. It's a very special day here today. Yes, it is Fashion Friday, but it's another special day, an even more special day. It is my rabbit's birthday. This is Ian, everyone. Say hi, Ian. This is Ian. Ian turns a very special day, age today. Ian turns 10 years old. That's right. I got this guy when he's probably about three to six months old. I picked April 10th as his birthday. It's not the day that I bought him. It's a few months before, but I picked that as his birthday because I figure why not? Uh, back in 2020, if you believe it, uh, he was so tiny that he could fit in the palm of my hand. They told me he was a... Uh, they told me he was a dwarf and they lied or they were mistaken. This is Ian. You see his eyes are just tiny. Hi, say hi, Ian. You know, he always looks so nervous. That's just the way that his fur looks around his eyes. Uh, you may notice his eyes look a little bit cloudy and that's because Ian, oh, there you go, buddy. Ian uh, has glaucoma, which is apparently a fat, relatively common thing on animals as they start to get a bit older. And Ian is 10, uh, taken proper care of. They live similar lifespan to dogs and cats. 15 to 18 years old is not outside of the realm of possibility. Uh, they're just a poor things are really really nervous lots of the times or uh, you don't take proper care of them You don't feed them properly. They can develop diabetes or you know those sorts of problems uh, So luckily I've been taking very good care of him over the years bought him back in 2010 when I was doing mostly kids magic Kids birthday parties and people wanted a pretty white rabbit and as you notice he's got blue eyes instead of those scary red ones So I'm in a store and uh, just had to have him uh, a quick note about Rabbits, they're excellent introductory pets. They really are. They have a fastidious nature similar to cats. They, are, they can be litter trained very easily uh, and they can be trained to uh, answer when you call their name. So they're a really good introductory pet. And here's the thing is that you can find them for relatively cheap. And the best place to go is to go to rabbit shelters. If you look around, there are lots of rabbit shelters, I'm sure, in your area, especially after uh, Easter time people buy rabbits because like, oh, it'll be cute, a rabbit for Easter. And then they're like, well, we're done with this. And then they just give them up. Uh, and that's a shame because they're really wonderful pets. Um, they can be very, very playful or, you know, they can be more shy, uh, but they are wonderful, wonderful pets. And when you buy them from a shelter, you're saving an animal in need. And also uh, they're usually already uh, spayed or neutered. And they also are usually already litter trained. So check out your nearby Rabbit shelter if you'd like to adopt a rabbit. Anyways, now that that's over with, uh, in order to celebrate Ian's birthday, we're going black tie, baby. That's right, we're going to go over the basics of the penultimate dress code. Now the fanciest dress you can have is called white tie. That's what you used to see people in with the tails, those long flowing things, like whenever you see the old Bugs Bunny cartoon, someone sits down in a piano, he flicks those tails out. It's called tail, tail coats uh, with a white tie and the white waistcoat. That is the most fancy that you can get. Uh, that is evening attire, and that's usually something you wear at the Met Gala or something really, really posh. Black tie uh, used to be pretty standard attire for evening times. Nowadays, really, uh, they're pretty much only worn at weddings or proms, that kind of thing. And usually there's a lot of kind of frivolity involved in that where they're not really sticking strictly to classic black tie. I'm gonna try to make this video as quickly as possible because uh, I'm trying to encourage people to watch these things and I know that I tend to drone on. And also, uh, I'm actually allergic to uh, animals with hair like cats and dogs and rabbits, as it turns out. Uh, and so Ian, when I play with him for short periods of time, I'm fine right now and we're, we're in bigger rooms. I'm fine, right now we're in a smaller room. So I need to do this video quickly before I'm just a dripping mess. But I love him, he's worth it, aren't you buddy? Yes. What is black tie? Black tie is characterized by wearing a tuxedo jacket or dinner jacket, as sometimes they're called. Uh, a black bow tie with a tuxedo shirt. Uh, you don't need to have the pocket square, but you can. And then the other thing it's characterized by are the matching trousers with the satin stripe down the side, as well as the patent leather shoes. Now, I'm sure you've watched, you know, red carpet events for things like the Tonys or the Grammys or the Oscars or Golden Globes, Emmys, whatever it is. And people usually wear a black tie, but they've been a lot of liberties people are taking nowadays. We're gonna stick to just it in its strictest sense. Nowadays, it's not uncommon to see people wear a nice black silk necktie to go along with it. For me, this is, there's a reason why this exists. Every man looks good wearing this because you've got this V shape that's been created here. You have this pop of white to bring the focus here, which brings your focus up to your face while still looking really, really nice and trim. It's a wonderful look on darn near any man. Now let's take a look 
at the distinguishing factors of what makes a dinner jacket a dinner jacket. Now, there are several different styles when it comes to the lapel. Here, I'm wearing what's referred to as a peak lapel, which most people, traditionalists at least, consider to be the classic shape for that. As you see, it creates these nice sharp peaks here, and it's actually connected by a bit of thread so that these don't flop down too much. It creates a nice sharp V. Now, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, something that was much more popular was the shawl lapel, which was completely rounded did not have any notches or any cuts in it whatsoever. It was a single shining bit of fabric that led all the way around, as opposed to nowadays we have this, where you only get this satin facing here. Now that is one of the most notable features of a dinner jacket are the satin facing. Sometimes it's silk, sometimes it's grow grain, uh, but usually it creates this iridescent or shiny type effect and it brings in just a little bit of pop here, which you'll notice that most suits do not have. Some uh, tuxedos also just do piping where you only get trim instead of the entire facing. As I mentioned, uh, traditionalists really only consider peak or shawl lapel to be the only true lapels. For that, most days you can find a uh, notch lapel, which I don't think looks quite as good. It's not quite as flattering for the male form. Another thing you'll notice that makes this unique is that there's only one button here. Ignore the uh, wire for my microphone there. One button, single button. Now, uh, lots of times you will find dinner jackets that have two buttons uh, and they still have that facing. You can see how this actually has satin facing over it. It's completely rounded and dome-like so that you can't see any thread here, and it's satin, so it matches the uh, lapels. One button is what's considered proper, and then you'll also notice this is a satin facing here on the tops of the pockets. Uh, if you get a, a dinner jacket, most of the time there will be flaps on the outside. Now for most jackets, you always wanna wear the flaps of the pockets out. Don't ask me why, it's just one of the things that's proper, but for a dinner jacket, you really want to leave those in. So these it's almost like a convertible type thing where you can leave them in if you'd like, or you can leave them out. I've always been told that for dinner jackets, you want them to not have the flaps out, and lots of dinner jackets don't even come with pocket flaps. It's just a straight slit in. You'll also notice that this has no vents. I'm sure you've noticed before that your jacket usually has either a single vent down the back, or it's got two vents alongside. If it has no vents, then it is more of a formal jacket it's a more formal style and with uh, tuxedo jackets dinner jackets you typically don't want any vent so if you're going for as formal and as traditional as you can you want the satin faced lapels in peak or shawl see someone was wearing notch notch lapels and that is the fashion police going to get them that is what happens when you wear notch lapels with two buttons and double vents Ugh, awful and on top of that, you're going to want to get a single button. You want no vents. All right, good. Now let's talk about the neckwear really, really quickly here. As I mentioned, some people are starting to wear black neckties nowadays. And for me, that creates this uh, kind of divided look. If you wear a black necktie that hangs down here, now you're splitting up this really nice field of white. It really has focus to you see, boom, the white, and it brings your focus up because it widens upward and brings the focus up towards the head. And the necktie, and the necktie I think, doesn't quite do that as well. Uh, the, whereas the bow tie has this really nice kind of floating point of reference uh, that can help balance out your head shape as opposed to just a long thing underneath it where it looks like your head's on a, on a pike or something. Just not, in my opinion, what you want. Let's take a moment to talk quickly about a tuxedo shirt. Most tuxedo shirts you'll see will have this wing collar here, which is like a little triangle, right? And that's what you'll mostly see most of the time. But you notice that with this one, it has a reinforced bib. This one is a peak style material. This shirt's actually designed for white tie. With white tie, you always want the wing collar and it doesn't have French cuffs. This has a battle cuffs or convertible cuffs, which is apparently more standard for white tie. But for a black tie tuxedo shirt nowadays, it's a little bit more on trend to have a normal style collar. You can have semi-spread, widespread, Italian, French, whatever you want. Uh, but I like this look a little bit better because with just the white triangle, then you see this black band going around the neck 
and it kind of creates an extra line that I'm not crazy about, but you can absolutely do it, especially since lots of shirts have that. Lots of shirts also have pleating. You'll see that they have pleating along the sides here. Uh, that'll be, you know, anywhere from, you know, an eighth inch to a half inch, sometimes a full inch on some of these other shirts, a full inch. And what that does is that it allows you to starch the shirt. You can use some starch either at the dry cleaner or when you are actually ironing your shirt, you can starch it and it forces it to lay flat. Because back in the day, we used to have a separate bib. These collars and the bibs were separate and they attached in. And what that did is it created a nice flat look. You can see how there's not too many wrinkles going through here, as opposed to if I were wearing a normal white shirt, you'd see wrinkles all the way around. You'll notice how this has an actual reinforced bib here. It's a second layer of material. Another thing that makes black tie unique is the waist covering. Now the waist coverings have fallen out of style nowadays. Lately, if you buy uh, lots of tuxedo trousers will actually have a bit of a, a band here of some kind of satin face material. I know I've seen that before in the past, but the reason why we have these waist coverings is because, first of all, uh, since we have reinforced it, it's something to reach up towards that so you don't see the end of this. And the other reason, is the real reason why it happens is functionally, it elongates the apparent look of the waist. So right now, my waist comes right up to about, eh, right up to where my belly button is right? Which looks all good and well. When you have the waist covering, like traditionally a cummerbund, which is something you can find, it raises where that should be. And now you have a smaller torso and longer legs, and it just makes you look taller, and it reinforces an ideal shape. You'll also notice here that I am wearing white silk suspenders and it has the uh, button tabs of course uh, where it's actually a braided material instead of what you might see as a leather yoke right uh, this so is so that it lays down flatter and now uh, it, nothing breaks up the lines here when you look at this image you don't have black stripes you have the white and it all blends together so it creates this nice clean crisp upper torso with just a hint a pop of flair with the bow tie so this is one of the more traditional looks for black tie. You, you want the waist covering and the black silk or satin bow tie. Now let's say you don't like the look of a cummerbund. Sometimes for men, if you've got a bit of a pudgy belly, it just kind of sticks out and it doesn't look quite as good. Well then might I recommend a proper waistcoat. Now when I say a proper waistcoat, I don't mean one of those shiny colored one that comes all the way up to here that you used to wear at prom. That's not what I mean. That's gonna make you look like a high school student who doesn't know anything. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Please. I mean, you can if you'd like, but please. What I have here is a U-line waistcoat. These are a little bit more rare in style, but they came around, I think in the 1910s, 1920s, these became a little bit more popular. Uh, someone in England was wearing them. And if you've ever seen Phantom of the Opera, this is the type of waistcoat he wears. It is harder to find. Houdini used to wear these kinds of styles as well. And the really nice thing about it, you'll notice that it does not have any satin on it. It is a matte black. This is from Charles Tirrett. As far as I know, they're the only ones who still make these, at least not custom. You can buy this, uh, you can go to the website. It's not cheap, 100, 200 bucks, something like that, but it is worth it in my opinion because it creates a very nice look. I'll show you what that looks like. Here is the look with the waistcoat, which I absolutely love. Now you notice that we do get kind of that banding effect that I was talking about, but it's thicker now. It seems very, very intentional. Yes. Uh, not quite as bad if you've got a bit of a pudgy tummy. It still creates the effect of elongating the torso, but it connects it to something else. And it looks very, very nice with the bow tie done and up. This is not something you would wear with a black necktie. This uh, is great if you're going for a slightly more vintage look. Or if you really want to stand out, but in a good way, in a way that shows that I am still rooted in the classics I understand what traditional is, and I'm gonna go back to something a little bit different in the history of black tie. So it's still, in my opinion, very socially acceptable. 
and I get lots of compliments on this waistcoat whenever I go black tie. I absolutely wear one of these. Once again, and it covers the bib that you would normally have and it just looks terrific. I'll show you with the jacket as well. Looks absolutely great with the dinner jacket as well. The nice thing about these waist coverings is that you won't see them when your jacket is buttoned, which is most of the time, but when you want to kind of cut loose a little bit and leave it open, they get to see this. It's still a nice flat black, doesn't draw too much attention, but still achieves the look of elongating the legs. Get a nice little pop of reinforcement here to bring the focus up to the head and the face. So I'm in love with this style of waist covering. Now, there are a few instances when you would not want to wear a waistcoat, when you would want to stay with the cummerbund. Because the waistcoat has more material, it's a little bit warmer. So if you're going white tie in the summer, you want to stick with that waistcoat. And if you're going white tie in the summer, there's another fun accessory that you can have as well. The white or off-white or cream dinner jacket. This is a very bold look. You might recognize it from, uh, I believe, one of the first James Bond movies, Sean Connery comes into the Monte Carlo Casino. That's just the jacket probably he wore when he ordered that martini, shaken not stirred. This is goes back into history as uh, for when people would have summer events outside, is a little bit warmer, and so there's a lighter material. Breeze better, traditionally made of a cotton or a cotton wool blend, I believe. Now, Strictly speaking, a pure white dinner jacket is not very, very common. Uh, I kind of like the look. However, it is very difficult to keep clean. I do have a cream one, but it's at the tailors and then all this uh, quarantining started happening. So I couldn't go get my nice off-white dinner jacket from the tailors. But you notice that these ones always have this shawl collar lapel. At least now they do. I think in James Wan, he actually had a notch style lapel or a peak. But this one does not have satin facing. It is just the white or off cream. And this you want to wear with the cummerbund because uh, it's the whole point of it is that it's for tropical weather. So it's very popular on cruise ships or any kind of summertime event. This is when it's appropriate to wear the white or off white dinner jacket. And you want to wear that with this cummerbund here. A little note on the cummerbund, always make sure that the Little flaps here, the pleats are facing upwards. Uh, people joke and say it's so that you can catch crumbs. That's totally not true at all. But this is another bold look that is also acceptable for a white tie in the summer. They say that you're supposed to uh, stop wearing this before. Never wear white after Labor Day is what they say. And the reason for that really is just because of the weather. It starts to get a little bit colder after Labor Day. We start heading into September. And so you want to return back to your black dinner jackets for that. So a couple of quick notes about black tie. Uh, if you do not have a tuxedo and you still are going to a black tie event, I highly recommend just buying a tuxedo. It's absolutely worth it. I know it might seem like kind of an, unnes an unnecessary investment, but you won't regret it. You can find them for relatively cheap. Uh, actually, pretty soon, my magical look, we're gonna start offering made to measure tuxedos as well. But until then, a black suit will get you by in a pinch, all right? The black bow tie is kind of a ne necessity. I would say a black necktie will do in a pinch, all right? Uh, but really want the black bow tie satin, uh, preferably learn how to tie your own. Uh, I posted a video a couple weeks ago of me teaching how to do all sorts of different ties of neckties, but I'll probably do one on just the bow tie next week or something like that. So stick around. If you can't afford to wait until we start making our own made to measure tuxedo coats, uh, this is a really good, this is actually my performance tux. This isn't the one that I wear to events. This is the one that I wear when I'm performing on stage. And there's a reason for that. This is from Neil Allen. Their formal collection, you can buy this on uniformalwarehouse.com. Uh, it's pretty darn affordable. I think it's maybe less than 200 bucks to get the top and the bottom together. And the really nice thing about this is that it's polyester, still looks decent because the fit's more important than the material most of the time. And it's machine washable. Because I'm constantly performing on cruise ships or on tours, I and I'm ducking in, you know, from you know town to town. I don't get to stick around for a few days and make sure that they do my dry cleaning. Having a machine washable tuxedo is invaluable to me because I can wash it in the laundromat. I can, you know, if I'm at the theater, I can throw it backstage and 
and wash it and then let it hang up and dry. It is really, really invaluable to have a machine washable one for me at least. And it still looks pretty decent. Another quick note about the tuxedo. You want to buy the pieces together from the same maker, which I know can be difficult if you have sizes that are not necessarily standard. Most tuxedos uh, or suits in general, when you buy them, if you buy the two pieces together, there's a six or an eight inch drop. Six is the most common. And what that means is that, let's say you are a 38 uh, in shoulders, right? Uh, then that means that subtract six from that. And that's what the waist is going to be, 32 inch waist. And that's what standardly comes. Sometimes it's seven or eight inches, which means you gotta have a 30 inch waist and 38 inch shoulders. And that is not a common thing, at least not for me. I'm, I am a little bit, tiny bit pudgy around the midsection. So I oftentimes have to buy mine separately, but you gotta buy them from the same maker, the same brand, because when you don't, there's a slight variation in the material that they use. It's not the same fabric, which isn't always really, really obvious, but in certain lighting, a difference in the fabric material can really make one shine more red and one shine more blue. And that's very obvious that they didn't come from the same fabric. From the same makeup. For instance, this is a wonderful tuxedo jacket that I bought off of eBay and it's from the 70s. Look, check out these awesome wide lapels. And then notice here, they are peak. They do not have a little bit of fabric up here holding it because there's almost like a little tiny notch built into them. But wearing this with these trousers, if you look really, really carefully, you can see a difference in the material and the way that it catches the light, whether it's in the exact shading and it once again depends on the lighting but there's going to be a difference, a subtle difference, but a difference nonetheless. And that is going to kind of cause a clash because the idea is uniformity here. So let's say you are invited to a black tie event, but you don't have black tie. You don't have a tuxedo shirt, you don't have a tuxedo jacket. Well then, uh, here's what I'm gonna say. You can get by with just a nice black suit, all right? Uh, and there is a difference between having a black suit and a black tuxedo, as we've discussed about the little differences in the number of buttons and the way that everything sits and the satin, all that jazz. But a black suit will do in a pinch with a nice white shirt and a black necktie. If you don't own a black bow tie, you absolutely should. They are wonderful. So now let's say though that you don't have a tuxedo shirt, right? You don't have anything with or without the pleats, anything like that. Well then here's what you're going to want to use. You want a good white dress shirt. There are several requirements here. You want a white dress shirt that does not have a pocket, a breast pocket, all right? Ideally, you also want French cuffs as well because with this, you can create a passable look for a tuxedo. I'll show you. So this is not a tuxedo shirt, but in a pinch, it'll do. And I've done it before in the past. Uh, as long as it has no pockets here and you have the French cuff, because then you can put a tuxedo cuff link into it, which you'll see is a uh, round and black. There are a few different styles as well, but this is the most common. Then you can get away with it. As you can see, once you start to put on all of the accoutrement, then it really starts to kind of blend in and you can't notice. One of the uh, unique features of the tuxedo shirt is that most of the time they will have, if you can see the buttons at all, they will have an option for studs as well. So there'll be a wee slit next to it. And what that's designed for you to do is it's designed for you to take a tuxedo stud, or I think I've heard some people refer to them as pips. What you do is you push that through so that you have these nice black buttons that show. That way it matches. They usually sell them in a set as well with the cufflinks. So you have these black buttons that come down and then you have the little tiny black on the cuffs and it all starts to get all matchy matchy and look really, really nice. Now let's say you don't own one of these nice white dress shirts. Now hopefully soon we'll start making custom tuxedo shirts or made to measure tuxedo shirts for my magical look as well. I'm chatting to Collar and Lapel, the, uh, mass, the uh, tailor studio that handles our made to measure clothes. But until then, we do custom dress shirts. And I highly recommend getting one of these styles of shirts because they're very versatile. They're very nice. Like I said, you can fake it in terms of a tuxedo, but it also looks great at interviews, at auditions, at everything. It's just a really nice, clean look, the French cuff. So if you go into uh, mymagicallook.com, you click Made to Measure, you click Design Dress Shirt, you pick a white fabric, make sure that there's no uh, pocket, yes. Uh, if you want to get a little extra fancy, you can cover, you can get a covered placket, you can hide the buttons, 
because some of them it's a box placket. Uh, if you get the covered placket function, then it still looks good on a normal look, a normal suit, a normal way of wearing it, but it then also adds it, lends a little extra air to the formality if you're gonna double it as a tuxedo shirt. So get the covered placket, no pocket here, get French cuff, all right? Uh, and then I recommend getting just normal collars. There is an option for the tuxedo collar, even though it's not technically a tuxedo shirt, I say stay away from that because then it's more versatile because then you can wear it with a tux and no one will notice that it's not a tux shirt. But if you need to wear it as a tux shirt, as you can see, it still looks fan-bloody-tastic. You will notice how we are getting a little bit more wrinkles. You see how there's wrinkles everywhere. Not, you know, sharp wrinkles, but folds in the fabric that are starting to happen as a result of the various pressure points that are on it. So that's not quite as tuxedo-y. You want a really, really crisp, flat look. Uh, you can kind of counterbalance that by getting a shirt stay. If you're not familiar with a shirt stay, uh, there are a few different styles, but basically it clips onto the bottom of your shirt and it tugs it down. They're like garters for men and it tugs the shirt down. The nice thing about that is that it stops it from getting un, uh, untucked. It's starting to kind of bulge out, especially if you have a shirt that doesn't fit you well, like a shirt that is, you know, too big around for you. You'll really start to notice that when you wear that, you tuck in your trousers, you get this look where they start to billow up. But shirt stays are elastic and they either clamp or they hook in and they prevent the shirt from coming out and doing that. And before I started getting made to measure shirts, that happened to me all the time. But now that I've made to measure shirts, there's not enough material for that to happen with. So another reason why made to measure shirts are just really, really superior. They're not that much more expensive than you'd spend on a normal shirt and they're gonna fit you right off the bat. You don't have to take them into the tailor. So, so there you are, gang, a quick breakdown on the basics of black tie, all right? What makes a black tie is you want the white shirt, specifically a tuxedo shirt. So whether it is peak style with the reinforced bib, you can have uh, buttons showing, you can have studs showing, you can have a uh, covered placket so there's nothing showing, you can have pleats, you can have no pleats, uh, just you want that reinforced shape in the front there to help keep things a little bit flatter, all right, not quite as wrinkly as it is with a normal shirt, but in a pinch, an, a normal shirt with no pocket will absolutely get by if you must, you know, if you're not planning on going to a bunch of black tie events but you need to kind of throw them together. With a black suit, and a black bow tie and a white dress shirt, specifically with French cuffs, will look great. Uh, but when you're looking for your tuxedo jacket, might I highly recommend getting one with the satin facing peak lapel, or if you have, you think you have the body shape or the facial structure, because remember that you're kind of working off of the your facial structure here. If you have a really, really round face, you may want to avoid a round lapel, as it's just so many round edges. You want to kind of vary that look up a little bit. Single button with the satin facing here. Don't forget your nice white pocket square. All right, and you want the patent leather shoes, patent leather shoes. So now with uh, patent or patent leather dress shoes, uh, you'll notice that they are really shiny. And what's nice is that you don't actually have to really shine these. You can take a, a, an eraser, a pencil eraser, and you can scratch, you can buff out scratches. Uh, and if you just take some water and wipe these down and dry them off, they look good as new, uh, and I haven't even cleaned these off in a while. If you look closely, you can see there's some sediment on there. A lot of that stuff kind of comes off. Of course, you want to use a, uh, a shoe tree with these. Shoe trees are invaluable if you have nice leather shoes. I'm sure you already know about them if you have leather shoes. Uh, they basically keep the material stretched out so that these creases don't get a chance to really, really sink in. But most of the time with these patent leather shoes, uh, you are going to get either black shoelaces or you can buy nice silk shoelaces that are kind of a little bit wider and flatter, like ribbons essentially. Uh, for me, I like this little tiny pop of color or if I know I'm gonna be a bit more traditional or time period uh, accurate, then I'm going to uh, switch back to the black ones. Or another thing that is uh, kind of popular in some circles are these, these are pumps, these are like slip-on shoes. Uh, but they're still patent leather. But they're still patent leather, as you can see, these are actually pre-owned. I've got them for a steal on eBay. eBay's great to keep an eye out for stuff and they're in my size, seven double wides. Uh, but they also look Really, really nice. Still don't have the, you know, the pop of the teal laces, but are going to go really, really well with the overall look. 
when I normally wear the teal shoelaces, I have a teal pocket square as well. So you get just a touch of variance. That's the thing is you don't have to look like a uniform penguin when you wear a tuxedo, you know, from a distance. Yes, you will see black on white or white on black. But when you get closer, you can, there's so many ways to vary it up and switch it up and to show your personality. Me, rooted in the classics, so I love to have this peak lapel. I prefer to have a covered placket. I ha like having that lay down collar instead of the uh, wingtip collar here with the, the nice black bow tie. All right, I love to have a teal pocket square here with the teal shoelaces. And I also have teal suspenders as well, which I will oftentimes wear because that's a nice little tiny touch that you won't really notice until you take off the jacket. And since I'm wearing the waistcoat anyways, you will, as I'm moving around, if I've set my jacket down, you might get a flash of that teal there, flash the teal here, flash the teal there, just as a little anchoring in visual thing. But for the most part, I love that traditional style. So. You want the silk or satin striping down the side of the trousers. You want your satin faced lapels on a single button, no vent jacket, traditional speaking, with your tuxedo shirt, the white bow tie. Trust me, you love the way the bow tie looks. If you don't, fine, go with a nice black necktie. Just try to match the width of the necktie to the width of the lapel here so it doesn't look disproportionate. Uh, and then also, no watch. Traditionally speaking, no watch. If you're gonna wear a watch, it's gotta be something really, really uh, low profile, uh, like something with not a lot of flashy numbers. You want a bulky, like a diver's watch or a sports watch. You want a flat dress watch. Do you want black? Preferably with a leather band, doesn't have to be a leather band. I have one that's kind of like this metal grid looking thing that I can't find at the moment. Uh, with a black facing as well. They say that if an evening watch has a black or a dark color uh, face to it. Uh, or something like this. You can see there's no flashy numbers on this. They kind of look like Movados, but they're not because I can't afford that, right? So something like this is about as big or as thick as I'd go. You want a nice dress watch. What's funny is that this strap is more expensive than this actual watch face because I bought a cheap watch face because I wanted something that lays flat, but the, uh, the leather band was no good. So while I was on a cruise ship, I bought a leather band from a Philip Stein. Apparently it's a kind of posh brand. But that way, you want something that is low profile enough that it will immediately get covered up by the shirt that you're wearing. And then you can catch a subtle glimpse at it. And the other reason why you don't wear a watch or carry a pocket watch with you is because when you are at a black tie event, this is an event. This is a thing that you have spent devoted time to get dressed up for. And this is whoever's event this is. This is their event. You are there for their event. You don't need to know the time because there's nothing for you to be getting to. Right, you were there for the evening, right? Because it is a very special event. You don't need to pop off for drinks or take a phone call. It shows that you're not focused on the time. You're focused on the people that you are around, your host and the event that you're at. So traditionally speaking, no watches if you need to, something like this, or if you've got the waistcoat, you can get away with a little simple chain and a pocket watch with the uh, open face, not one that clicks to open, because that way you can pull it out of your pocket and immediately see the time without having to go through the, the rigmarole of, let me see the click, check the time, close it, put it back in the pocket. Uh, but that's traditionally speaking, of course. I know we move past tradition in many, many ways, and we are constantly evolving as a culture when it comes to fashion or to language. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with evolving a tiny bit, but I'm letting you know what the absolute classics if you want to stay in that and then start to build out from there. So, no watch. Matching pieces for the top and bottom, satin stripe, uh, satin lapel, uh, yes, black bow tie, I think I said all that. Patent leather shoes, yes. And black socks. Stick with the black socks. That is my opinion. For me, my pop of color is the shoelaces. If you want to have black shoelaces, then maybe a pop of color in your uh, socks, and that's absolutely all right as well. Uh, it just depends on how you're wearing your trousers. If you like that really short cut look to constantly show off your socks, I would say stick with black because you don't want people constantly looking down at your feet. The nice thing about the patent leather shoes is that they're shiny, but they still go in. You have shiny here, little shiny there, little shiny here. It all goes together. Once you incorporate something as bright as socks uh, into the outfit, that is for me something that you save for other times. But you're absolutely allowed to play around. If there's anywhere for you to play around with it, it would be socks. It would be accessories like the uh, pocket square or the uh, braces. That would be the area to play around with it. So if you want to go with colored socks, go for it. I prefer black socks. But then again, I have my peak color in the shoelaces. 
Oh, I almost forgot. Hatware. I was once performing murder mystery dinner theater uh, with this wonderful company called Gourmet Detective. If anyone from Gourmet Detective is watching, hey. And uh, this gentleman walked in with an amazing tuxedo. It was sharp, it was well fitted to his body. The length of the sleeve was perfect, showed just enough of the cuff. He had on, I believe he had patent leather shoes. Uh, don't wear spectators. That's the one that's two-tone, like the black and the white or the white and the brown. Don't wear those. Those are technically considered informal shoes. There's like day shoes, walking around shoes. So don't wear those. I know it looks really fancy. It isn't actually fancy. If anything, wear spats, which is uh, the, um, they're usually cotton or uh, some kind of special covering. To, it's a stop from splatter of mud and stuff from getting on your shoes. Those are a little bit better. But, uh, and then he walked in with this sharp tuxedo with a brown fedora. Don't get me wrong, it was a nice fedora, but it was a brown fedora. If it had been a dark gray, maybe. Fedoras you can kind of get away with with wearing like a nice, like a good fedora, wide brim, not this like trilby inch and a half stuff. That doesn't look too good in my opinion. Like for instance, now it wasn't quite this shade of brown. I think it was actually a lighter brown than this, but imagine this. Now this is a dark brown, so this almost kind of gets away with it, but when you get close, you can see that that's brown against all this black. It just doesn't look good. And it was a nice wide brim one. It was clear, it was like an Indiana Jones type looking thing. It was a nice, uh, fedora, but it just totally threw off the whole look for me. Uh, now, let's say here's a nice black fedora, but this is really more of a trilby because look how narrow the uh, hat band is. See how it kind of creates the, uh, sorry, the, the brim is, right? And once again, this technically fits my head, but it's small. A small, because it's such a small shape on top of my head, it throws off the balance of my head shape. It looks, it's almost like a Laurel Hardy look where the hat is too small. Now here is something that's a little bit more acceptable. This is a gray fedora, slightly wider brim now, but it's got the black hat band. So at least it kind of anchors in a tiny bit. Still probably wouldn't wear this together, but that is a little bit more acceptable. In the past I have worn with this hat, this is most expensive hat I own. This was a custom job back in the 60s. I found it at a, um, hat shop, uh, slightly wider brim. This is a, you know, a charcoal, dark charcoal, really nice fabric felt. Well, once again, a little bit narrow on the brim there. My head was a little bit narrower then so I could get away with that. This is a little bit better because it's darker. Kind of goes with it. So I have in the past worn this to go with a tuxedo, but only outside. You take your hats off when you go indoors. It's a respect thing. Traditionally speaking, not a top hat. Top hats go with evening wear. Traditionally speaking, the only hat that I know of that is a solid yes to go with a tuxedo is a Homburg, also known as the Godfather style hat. It is almost like a fedora, uh, except it's got this pinch crown. They're usually firm too. This is wool, but it's firm. Uh, the nice uh, grosgrain hat band, and it's curved up. Does not have a snap brim, doesn't snap down. It's not supposed to. Uh, this is from the Scala. Not the best thing with my head shape, but classically speaking, this is the only acceptable hat I know of, there could be others, that goes with a normal tuxedo and not tails, is the Homburg. Not the best thing for my head shape, but if I know I'm gonna be outside, I know that maybe uh, it might be raining. I'll throw on a coat, like a nice black overcoat, and something like this. Not too shabby. So, ooh. so there it is, guys. A quick and basic breakdown for black tie. Now, of course, if you're trying to do something historical, there's a lot of differences. There's a wonderful website called blacktieguide.com. It's a wonderful website. Uh, I, I'm constantly checking them because, you know, of all the time travel that I do, I always want to make sure I don't show up in a fashion that was, you know, 20 years behind or 20 years ahead. That'd be embarrassing. You know, nothing worse than showing up to F. Scott Fitzgerald's, uh, you know, one of his fancy dinner parties wearing a jacket from the wrong decade. Am I right? So I hope that this was enlightening. I hope it wasn't too long. I hope everyone enjoyed the video and learned something from it. I hope everyone enjoyed getting to meet Ian. Yes, yeah, I know I'm going to put you back in your own playpen. He's got this playpen. The door's open so he can run around anywhere, but he just, he just, you know, gets outside. He's like, 
Nah, I'd rather be inside my playpen. If anybody has any questions, don't be afraid to get into the comments. Did I teach you something you didn't know? Uh, is there something that you disagree with? Feel free to let me know in the comments. I do my best to uh, answer and respond to every single comment uh, that I get. And if you're interested in learning more about the services we have to offer at My Magical Look, go to MyMagicalLook.com or Facebook.com slash MyMagicalLook. Please subscribe, please like. If you don't feel like taking half a second to click the button, that's absolutely fine. But if you subscribe, it means a lot to me. And also you get to learn about the videos that I post up uh, because they're not old fashioned. Sometimes it's me doing magic. Sometimes it's clips from me on TV. Sometimes it's stuff from years ago. Uh, I'm, you know, just trying to just kind of crank out some content and be creative in this time. I'm also kind of turning my room into a recording studio. So uh, there might be some fun audio tracks, whether they're, you know, excerpts of books or something like that, or songs coming out soon. So thanks for watching everybody and uh, we will see you around. Bye.